on VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, you will hear stories from Andrew Smith, Dan Friedel, and Jill Robbins. Later, Dan Novak presents this week's education report. Finally, John Russell has today's lesson of the day. But first... Boeing announced this week that it was delaying the delivery of about 50 new planes to its customers because of a newly discovered manufacturing problem. The American Airplane Company is under increased scrutiny after part of one of its latest 737 passenger airplanes blew open mid-flight in early January. The unused door opening of an Alaska Airlines Boeing 737 MAX 9 blew out on January 5th as it took off from Portland, Oregon. The part is called a door plug. It closes off a space that would normally have an emergency exit in it. The door plug permits air carriers to have a few more seats on the plane instead of the exit. No one was hurt in the Alaska Airlines incident, but the plane suffered serious damage. Investigators said bolts meant to secure the door plug were not tightened properly. Many airplanes owned by Alaska Airlines and United Airlines were prevented from flying as the panels were fixed. Most are now flying again. The American Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, restricted the production of MAX 9 planes until it is satisfied with Boeing's safety measures. Now, another problem has come up. An employee of a company that makes parts for Boeing said some holes were not drilled correctly in the window frames of some MAX jets. That company... Spirit Aerosystems is also being looked at in more detail after the Alaska Airlines incident. Its parts were used to secure the door that blew out in January. One of Boeing's top leaders is Stan Deal. In a letter, Deal wrote that the company would have to perform rework on about 50 undelivered planes but it is not a safety problem for airplanes currently in use. The continued problems caused the leader of another airline, Emirates, to criticize Boeing. Tim Clark is the president of Emirates, a major airline based in Dubai. He noted a progressive decline. He said, The manufacturer must instill a safety culture which is second to none, noting the company's leaders likely understand this is their last chance to regain lost confidence. Both United Airlines and Alaska Airlines have expressed their anger at Boeing in recent weeks. United's leader, Scott Kirby, said it may consider purchasing planes from another manufacturer in the future. The FAA said, it is paying more attention to Boeing's large production center in Washington State. Jody Baker is the agency's Deputy Associate Administrator for Aviation Safety. Baker said the FAA plans to visit the factory and talk with employees who build the airplanes to find out about their concerns and the company's safety culture. Because of the recent problems, Boeing said it would withdraw a request it made with the FAA. The company wanted permission to deliver a smaller version of the 737 MAX airplane before redesigning a system that prevents the buildup of ice on engine inlets.
King Charles's cancer was caught early, British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said Tuesday. Sunak added that the nation is hopeful the king can make a full recovery. Buckingham Palace officials announced on Monday that the 75-year-old king had a form of cancer and would postpone his public appearances to receive treatment. The palace added that Charles was wholly positive and looking forward to returning to public work as soon as possible. Charles has been king for less than 18 months. He became king following the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth. He is planning to continue his weekly meetings with the Prime Minister and dealing with state papers. Charles's son, Prince William, is first in line to the throne. He is expected to fill in for some of Charles's duties. His younger son, Prince Harry, who has a troubled relationship with the family, arrived Tuesday from California to visit the king. Zunak said he had been shocked and sad at the news. All our thoughts are with him and his family. You know, thankfully... This has been caught early, Sunak told BBC Radio. Sunak said he was in regular contact with the king. That will, of course, continue as normal, he said. U.S. President Joe Biden expressed his concern on Monday and said he planned to call the king later. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau wrote on the social media service X, We are sending him our very best wishes and hoping for a fast and full recovery. The cancer was discovered recently when Charles stayed three nights in the hospital. At the time, he was undergoing a medical procedure for a non-cancerous enlarged prostate. Buckingham Palace officials have said he does not have prostate cancer. But they did not give any additional details about the kind of cancer the king has. The British royal family usually keeps medical issues private. But the palace said Charles wanted to make his diagnosis public. He is a backer of several cancer-related charities. Charles's treatment will likely draw attention to the long waiting times for cancer patients under Britain's state-run National Health Service, or NHS. Survival rates for cancer in Britain are lower than those of other European countries. A January NHS report shows that Britain is behind for 9 out of 10 of the most common kinds of cancer. I'm Andrew Smith. Inside a recording room at Queen Mary University of London, several researchers are working with new artificial intelligence, or AI, tools. Their aim is to develop what they call the new virtual worlds of music. Andrea Martinelli and Max Graf are among more than 30 doctoral students working with Matteo Barté, a senior lecturer in digital media. They are exploring the possibilities of computational creativity and generative AI. Generative AI is a term that describes technology tools designed to operate at human levels. Together, 
the researchers have set up a futuristic studio where music meets cutting-edge technology. Groth showed off a virtual instrument to reporters with the Reuters news agency. Groth calls the instrument NETS. NETS is played through an augmented reality headset. Augmented reality equipment combines the real world with computer-created content. The device Groff uses follows body movements to create musical sounds like notes and chords. Martinelli played a hitar, a guitar with AI sensors added to it. The sensors can read his movements to create percussive or drum-like sounds. These sounds cannot be made with a normal guitar. AI can be found in music making dating back to the 1950s. But recent progress in generative AI has led to divided opinions on the technology. Generative AI grew in popularity last year thanks to the ChatGPT language system. Generative AI can create new sounds, words for music, or entire songs on its own. But artists usually use simpler AI to add to their sound. British musician Youngblood said he believes AI can help his music go to another direction. Other musicians worry that the technology could go too far. Amy Love plays in the English rock group Nova Twins. She said she is not in favor of music that includes artificially generated voices of actual artists. She said she feels the same way about using dead artists' voices in songs. In November, the Beatles released the song Now and Then. It is considered the group's last song and includes the voice of Beatles musician John Lennon, who died in 1980. Lennon's voice sounds were taken from an old recording and recreated with AI. New York City-based entertainment company Warner Music said in November it was partnering with the estate of the late French singer Edith Piaf to recreate her voice using AI. Many experts say AI raises legal and ethical concerns. But guidelines on generative AI are still only in their early stage. Barté said, I think AI can have its place in the music production chain. But he added that is only possible if the technology is guided in the right way and if there are rules in place to make sure that musicians keep some amount of control. I'm Jill Robbins. Schools around the United States are installing sensors and cameras to identify possible use of vaping devices. Some administrators are also ordering serious punishments for use of the devices on school property. Alia Iglesias faced such punishments in her last year of high school in Texas. In February of 2023, School administrators caught her vaping in a bathroom. Suddenly, so much of her high school experience was under threat. Her student council presidency, her position as debate team captain, and her planned attendance at the graduation ceremony in May. She even faced possible loss of her college scholarships as a result of violating the vaping rules. She was sent to the district's alternative school for 30 days and was told she could have faced criminal charges. School observation equipment was used to catch Iglesias vaping. Many schools have installed the equipment without informing students. Students found vaping can also be charged with a misdemeanor and fined up to $100. Students found with vapes containing THC, the chemical that makes marijuana users feel high, 
can be arrested on felony charges. At least 90 students in the Tyler school system, where Iglesias was a student, have faced misdemeanor or felony charges. School systems around the U.S. have invested millions of dollars in the observation or surveillance technology. Administrators have used federal COVID-19 emergency relief money to buy the equipment. Marketing materials have noted the sensors at a cost of over one thousand dollars each. Check air quality to help fight the virus. Vapes are a major problem at many middle and high schools. The devices release vapor containing the highly addictive chemical nicotine. Millions of minors report vaping despite efforts to limit sales to kids by raising the legal age to 21 and a ban on flavored products. Some districts combine the sensors with surveillance cameras. When activated by a vaping sensor, those cameras turn on so violators might be identified. The Tyler, Texas schools, among others in America, have what they call a zero tolerance policy on vaping. The school system says that tracking vape usage deals with a problem that is hurting children's health. It would not comment on punishments of students. A leading provider, Halo Smart Sensors, sells 90% to 95% of its sensors to schools. The sensors do not have cameras or record audio, but can detect increases in noise in a school bathroom and inform school officials of that immediately," said Rick Cadiz. He is vice president of sales and marketing for IP Video, the maker of Halo Sensors. The sensors are marketed mainly for detecting vape smoke or THC, but they also can detect sounds like gunshots or words that are signs of possible bullying. During the pandemic, Halo noted on its website that indoor air quality observation was an approved use for federal COVID relief money. Schools now can use some of the almost 440 million dollars vape maker Juul is paying to settle a legal action against it. The claim accused Juul of marketing its products to youth. Cadi said, "All it's doing is alerting that something's going on." He said, "You need someone to physically investigate the alert that comes out." At the Coppell Independent School District in Texas, sensors are part of a vaping prevention plan that includes educational videos and a tip line. Students can receive fifty dollars for reporting on violators. Jennifer Valines, the district's director of students and staff services, said students were turning each other in right and left. Students can be sent to an alternative school or serve in-school suspensions, but are not expelled for vaping. She said. Iglesias's punishment included having to step down as student council president and debate captain, and leaving the National Honor Society. At the alternative school where she spent a month, students do their studies without attending classes. Iglesias was still able to attend her final school dance and graduation ceremony. Her college scholarship was not withdrawn either. She now attends Tyler Junior College. For her, the punishments for vaping go too far. The people that make these policies and implement these things sit in a room and do not walk the campuses or see the results, Iglesias said. I'm Dan Novak. Dan Novak joins me now to talk more about today's education report. Hi, Dan. Welcome. Hi, Ashley. There is an important phrase in the story that I was hoping you could define: zero tolerance. What does this mean? Sure. 
You often hear the term zero tolerance in relation to some sort of bad behavior at school that is considered unacceptable. It basically means that the behavior is strictly enforced. Zero tolerance usually means that if a student is caught doing that thing just one time, they're in trouble. They don't get another chance. Schools may have zero tolerance policies for things like bringing weapons or illegal drugs to school. So schools have zero tolerance policies for other things. Why is a zero tolerance policy for vaping any different? Well, vaping contains nicotine, which we all know is very addictive. The government has also started cracking down on vaping companies marketing their products to teens. So some schools are harshly punishing their students for doing something that is both highly addictive and being illegally marketed to them. Whether that's fair, I leave up to our audience. And schools are using unusual methods for catching students vaping. Yes, and I don't mean to say that vaping isn't a problem in schools. It definitely is. Some students have reported being unable to use the bathroom because of the amounts of vape smoke. So schools have installed sensors that can identify whether someone is vaping. The sensors appear to be quite effective, but of course this raises all kinds of privacy concerns. In many cases, the students aren't aware that they are being watched by these sensors. Well, thanks for answering those questions, and thank you for today's report, Dan. You're welcome, Ashley. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions. And experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. In this next report, Dan Friedel tells us about an honor presented by the National Garden Bureau (NGB). We learn that the organization named 2024. The year of the African violet. The African violet is a plant that came to the U.S. from Tanzania well over one hundred years ago. Pay careful attention to the word genus. We will talk more about it after the report. The African violet, a plant from Tanzania that came to the U.S. in The late 1800s received a special honor from the National Garden Bureau (NGB). The organization named 2024 the Year of the African Violet. Other plants, flowers, and vegetables for 2024 include squash, angelonia, lily, budleia, and hosta. Past years honored amaryllis, orchids, and broccoli. Jessica Damiano is the garden writer for the Associated Press News Service. She recently wrote about the African violet. Damiano said the violet has been one of the most popular house plants in the U.S. since it arrived. She said the plant, however, is not a violet. It only has the name because of its colorful purple and white leaves. In fact, she noted they are related to the Saint Paulia genus. They are named for German Walter von Saint Paul. The popularity of the plant is one reason why the NGB chose the violet as the house plant of the year," said Diane M. Blazek, the organization's director. She said the plant's name has appeared over three hundred thousand times on social media. Beyond popularity, Blazek noted, the violets are easy to grow, and people who breed flowers are working on creating new varieties. Blazek said they are coming through the pipeline. Blazek said people once thought of the violets as grandma's plants. Or that they were no longer popular, but she said the violet has not gone out of favor at all. 
The NGB started in 1920. The group aimed to give reliable gardening information to Americans, many of whom had only recently started growing plants at home. The founder was James Burdett. He helped develop the idea of victory gardens. The gardens started during World War I as a way for Americans to grow some of their own food. Today, the NGB continues the work started by Burdett. It recommends plants, flowers, and vegetables each year. Many people like the African violet because it is easy to grow. It does not need direct sunlight, it does not need too much water, and does not need a lot of fertilizer. However, it must receive special care to do extremely well. Blazek said, the plants like moisture in the air, so if you live in a very dry place, they might not do well. If you bring them inside during winter, Damiano suggests, you should run a device that adds moisture to the air, a humidifier, before you take them back outside. They need warmth, but do not do well in high heat. Be sure to consider your climate before planting them. In spring and summer, Damiano said, if the plants are indoors, place them near a window that faces north or east. That way they do not get too much sun. In the winter, the plants may be placed closer to windows because the sun is not too strong at that time for people who live in mid-northern climates. Feed the plants only every two to three months. Be sure to use a fertilizer for African violets. And do not worry about their roots getting crowded by other plants. They like cozy pots. With good care, the violets may show their colors all year. I'm Dan Friedel. Before the report we asked you to pay careful attention to the word genus. Can you remember when you heard it? You heard the term in reported statements from Jessica Damiano. Let's listen again. She said the plant, however, is not a violet. It only has the name because of its colorful purple and white leaves. In fact, she noted, they are related to the St. Paulia genus. We spell genus like this. G-E-N-U-S. Genus is a singular noun. We use the term almost always in the context of biology. A genus is a group of related animals or plants that includes several or many different species. In other words, a genus is a group of plants or animals that is bigger than a species. So, for example, Britannica Dictionary suggests that there are six species of flowering plants in the St. Paulia genus. If genus is a singular noun, how might we make it plural? The answer is this, genera. So, you could discuss one genus or two genera. Genus, and its plural form, genera, are not very common terms outside of discussions about biology. These terms are useful to recognize, but you probably do not need to worry too much about producing the terms unless you have a special interest in biology. And that's the lesson of the day. I'm John Russell. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. 